Have you ever been lost? I mean, like, really lost. Not on that song we just sang. I'm talking about in life. Have you ever been lost? One time, uh, after I was a new driver in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, I went up to Baltimore to go and visit a friend of mine. I lived in Virginia at the time. And you might be aware of this, but there's a, a road that basically goes around Washington, D.C. It's called the Belt Loop. It's called 495. It goes around. All right. Well, as a teenager, I, I didn't put together that it was a circle. All right. <laughs> Belt loop, I don't know what that meant. I just was like, okay, this is a road. And so on my way home from Baltimore, I was driving with my friend. And we were driving, and we had actually gone the wrong way. So I'm going to try to map this out. But imagine a big circle. Baltimore was here, and we lived here. And uh, we started driving the wrong way on the circle, right? And about maybe 10 minutes from the exit that would have gotten us home, we realized, oh, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> So we turned around and went about another hour all the way around. And you might be thinking, didn't he have a GPS? And believe it or not, this was before GPSs. Um, but it wasn't a pure, you know, it was a MapQuest generation, right? You remember printing out the MapQuest, which was helpful, but if you, if you got off route, you were in trouble. Because you were like, okay, I, I don't know where I am. And you pull out the book and you're like, okay, C4. Okay, where am I on the map? If you remember those map books, you might know what I'm talking about. If not. You're, you're a little lost there now. But the question is, have you ever been lost? And maybe you didn't even know you were lost, but really lost. Have you ever felt lost? Or do you remember the time in your life where you felt lost in your walk with God? Try to take some time to remember how that feels to feel lost. To genuinely not know where you are. Not know how to get back on track not know how to get to where you need to be. You know, Isaiah says that we all like sheep have gone astray. Who in your life do you know has gotten off the path? Who in your life truly needs to know Jesus so that their life can change here and now and forever in eternity? Take some time to imagine Maybe even close your eyes. Who can you picture that's genuinely lost right now? Who do you see? I hope you're seeing maybe pictures of family members, friends, maybe some co-workers, some neighbors, children, <laughs> classmates. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're like, I, I, I've never really been where, or I don't feel like I'm where I need to be with God, or I've never really fully committed to following Jesus and doing this whole Christian thing. And that feeling of being lost, imagine that person that you're thinking of feeling that and experiencing that lost feeling. We're not meant to be lost. We're meant to be found. We're meant to be in Him. You know, in Genesis chapter 15, God is giving Abram, who becomes Abraham, a vision. And he says, I want you to go outside of the tent, outside of this 12-foot ceiling, and I want you to go over and look at the stars in the sky. And imagine how many stars were up lighting up the night sky. It would have been a pretty epic scene. How I many of you guys have been camping before and looked up in the sky and you saw, wow, there are a ton of stars. Even out at Ohio Pile recently, Matt Cap and I were looking at the stars and there were, there were so many. You know, if you live in the city or in the Pittsburgh area, you look up and you see not the stars, but the star. <laughs> you're like, oh, the star's out tonight. You know, I can see the, the star. How nice. Maybe those in Butler, you're like, hey, we see stars all the time. That's good for you, but sometimes you look up and you see one or two stars, and other times you look up and you see a night sky full of stars. And God was trying to give Abraham this vision of, this is, this is who I want your, the, my people to be, to be a night sky full of bright lights. All your descendants will number this many people. He's given Abraham this vision. As a church, or as churches, American churches, there's kind of two ways to try to reach people. We're going to get back to the lost stuff, I promise. But two ways to reach those people that are lost. One way is to have a class or a preacher or a pastor be that bright, shining light. And other people have to go and find the teaching, find the class, and listen to that teaching, to the new member class, whatever it is. got to learn. And everything kind of gets filtered through the one bright, shining light. 
The other way around is to have lots of people know the gospel message and to say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an elder, I'm, not a, I'm just a Christian, but I can teach you. Why? Because I'm a bright, shining light and that God has put in your life. And so churches kind of take on two different plans, right? We're going to be, we're going to have one person and, and kind of bottleneck the growth of the church or the, the gospel message gets bottlenecked. Or every person can take up the mantle of being a bright, shining star to share the gospel message. I don't know about you, but I choose, I never can remember former or latter. I choose the second option, right? The second option, the latter option, right? Okay, thank you. The latter gets you to the next step. <laughs> I know that's not what that but no, the, the second option is what I choose, and, and I think that's what all of us would want, because who has the greatest chance to reach whoever it was that you were thinking about when you were thinking about someone that was lost? It's not me. It's you. You're in their life. You're talking to them. You're seeing them. I would love to help, and other people in this room would love to help, but you have the greatest opportunity to reach those people. And so it makes sense that all of us need to take up the mantle to be disciples. To be a, a disciple is someone who follows Jesus, and someone who follows Jesus helps other people follow Jesus. A disciple makes disciples. So the next three sermons that we're doing here for our series, Go With God, are a little bit different. If you're visiting with us, we're, we're doing a little bit of teaching on how to help somebody else know God. And again, that may apply for, hey, I need to know God right now. I need to re-examine my life. Have I been following God the way that the Bible says? Have I ever followed God the way that the Bible says? But join us here. We're not going to dive actually deep into the scriptures. We're going to do more of a survey and spread over several scriptures. And if you're hearing some of this stuff for the first time, I entreat you to dive in deeper. Because there's so much about this life here in eternity that God wants to offer you if we just go with him. Amen. So the next three sermons are bringing back kind of the, the Bible studies and bringing them to life. And the goal is to look at our own convictions, our own followership, and to make sure that we are striving to follow Jesus. That we're not settling for a cheap imitation of a watered-down, comfortable version that we often see around us. And that we too are equipped to help others teach people to be disciples. Make disciples and therefore be disciples. Amen? So that's where we're going today. And an important note before we get started on authentic discipleship, which is our topic today. An important note is that Bible study series doesn't save somebody. A Bible study series doesn't save somebody. Jesus saves, right? And a Bible study series is a great tool. In fact, Bob Mitchell is here. It's great to see the Mitchells. He spoke on this before he moved to Florida. And, and it stuck with me that, hey, Bible studies, that's a great tool but it's the word of God and it's Jesus and his salvation and his gift of grace that saves us. And we gotta make sure that we remember that. But there are, I believe, three things a person needs to be saved, to be with God, to become a Christian. A person needs to, one, fall in love with God. A person needs to, two, fall in love with the church because we're not meant to do it on our own. And three, a person is meant to believe the gospel and respond biblically. And what I like about our fellowship of churches is we study the Bible with people because we want to help them do those three things. Fall in love with God, fall in love with the church, and to believe the gospel and respond biblically. And so our Bible study series, what we're talking about in the next three, three weeks, is all about helping us help others do that as well. So let's let the Spirit of God speak to you and through you today and any time you share these scriptures that we're going to look at today with others. Let's pray together. God, I'm so grateful to dive into these, these topics, to dive into what it means to follow you authentically. As much as I love sitting down and opening the Bible and talking to others about this, I need it so much. I need the reminder. I need the, uh, the, the look at, at what it is that you expect of your followers. God, you have so much grace on us, but you also have a great vision for where you want to take us. God, I pray that we can obey and listen to your word today and follow you. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's jump in. If you have a Bible, you're going to need it today because we're going to be all throughout the scriptures. So Hebrews chapter 4 is where we're going to start. Hebrews chapter 4. I love this passage. It's kind of one of our go-tos in, in the Bible studies. I love this passage. I actually have this a tattoo of this passage uh, on some of you are like, you have a tattoo? It's a conversation for another time. But I love this passage, right? For the word of God is what living and active.
sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We'll stop there for a second. The Word of God is living and active. Do we really see it that way? When we think about studying the Bible with someone, do we really think, man, we are looking at scriptures that are living and active. And some of us kind of approach the Bible as if it was inactive and dormant. This has some useful principles, but it, it doesn't fully apply to every aspect of my life. And we kind of pass that on in the way that we study the Bible sometimes. We sit down and we say, okay, so what do you think it means that the Word is living and active? Well, I think it means it's alive. Yes, it's relevant to our life. That's very nice. And a double-edged sword? Any thoughts on that one? It's like, well, a double-edged sword, it can, it can hurt you and hurt so someone else. And you're like, yeah, that's right. It can, you know, and you're like, what are we even saying, right? They're, they're, we're just looking at helping someone get the right answers versus helping the Bible come alive and be active in their life. The Word of God is what? Living and active. It has application for every single aspect of our lives. Teens in the room, if you think the Bible is inapplicable to your life, you are dead wrong and you're missing something. And ask your parents, why do you think, mom and dad, why do you think the Bible is living and active? And have a conversation about how the Bible has been living and active in their life uh, on and off in different ways. God's word is so powerful. It's living and active. It is a double-edged sword. And, and by the way, a double-edged sword, the way we use it today, we might say, oh, it's a double-edged sword. If the point of a double-edged sword was to cut you and to cut someone else, that would be a very bad sword in battle, right? That's not that's the kind of appropriated meaning of the word today. But a double-edged sword simply meant a symbol of power and authority. Who was carrying the double-edged swords back in the day? It was the Roman soldiers that occupied the place where the Jewish Christians at the book of Hebrews is being written to. And so he's saying the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. Which means the Word of God is meant to have authority in our lives. If a Roman soldier said, hey, why don't you walk a mile with me? By the way, Jesus said, go, go with him two miles. But if a Roman soldier said, go and, and walk with me a mile, you had to say yes. And if you were questioning it, he would flash his double-edged sword and you would say, sir, yes, sir, let's go. There's authority in the Word of God. It's not this double-edged sword. Okay, it, can, it's this, it has, it's packed with authority and we're meant to see it that way. Here's what's really cool. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. So the authority of the day were the Roman soldiers, were the Roman guard, and they were oppressing the, the, the Israelites, oppressing, oppressing the Christians at this time. And yet there's hope in this passage because the greater authority is actually the Word of God. The Word of God has more authority than even the Romans that might kill you, but yet God's Word is more true than anything the Roman government can say to you. And so it's actually a promise that the Word of God is worth holding on to, that even though it might be costly to follow Christ, it will be worth it because it's the highest authority there is. The Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. Do you believe the Word of God is alive? And why have you been treating it like a dead book? That's going be a powerful question in a Bible study. It'd be a powerful question on a Sunday morning. For us to think, man, am I really treating the Word of God as if it's living and active? Let's look at another passage together. 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. Let's, let's read this together. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, there's only two things in the Bible that God breathes into. You know what they are? Yeah. The Bible and mankind. The Bible and you. The only thing 
The only other time that God, God breathes life into something are dead bones, and what do they do? They turn back into people. So God breathes life, but he also breathes his word. So if God created you with his breath, and he breathes out his words in the Bible, how much do you think you need God's word? You guys, we're made for each other. You come from the same source. You have the same source material. We need the word of God. God breathed life into it. It came from the mouth of God. We know the scripture that the word breath means spirit or inspired, right? When someone gives their last breath, they're kind of um, giving up their spirit. They're giving up their life. And so when it says God, ins it's inspired. Your Bible might even say all scripture is God inspired. So basically what this means is all scripture comes from God. And in a Bible study, what do we do? We ask, do you believe that the Bible is from God? And that is a very important question, a question we should never skip over. Because then you're, you're working from two different uh, aspects of reality, right? You, you can't really have a conversation if you're working off of two different uh, perspectives of reality. So do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? But sometimes we kind of skip over this question. Because we're like, I hope they say yes. If they say no, I don't know what to do. <laughs> right? Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And someone's like, yes. Sure, I grew up Christian. I, I believe that. You're like, sweet. Okay, let's move on. But what if we were to ask why? Why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And I think this question is more important now than ever. Because what's happening in Christianity today, what can happen in our lives today, is yes, we believe theoretically the Bible is the Word of God, but when we come across something that we don't really like or something that goes against kind of a cultural perspective of faith, we tend to dismiss it. Say, yeah, it's the Word of God, but not really that part. We've gotten good at not saying those words, but our life can kind of show that sometimes. So it's an important question for us, but it's, it's all the more important as the idea of truth and the Word of God being important to Christianity, which sounds like a ridiculous statement, the Word of God being important to Christianity. That's in question today. Someone recently posted and said, oh, it's more important to be Christ-like than biblical. And I thought, oh, okay. If your version of being biblical isn't Christ-like, then something's wrong. But also, if your version of being Christ-like isn't biblical, then it ain't Christ you're being like. It's something else. And so both are equally important. We've got to make sure that we're following the truth in the Bible and also following Christ. But they're not two separate things. They're, just, they're the same. How can we know how to follow Christ if, if we don't believe the Bible's the Word of God? That's a side note, but I thought that was important to say. But do you believe that the Bible's the Word of God? Why? And we don't have time to dive into that today, but what would be your answer? Because that's what my church teaches? That's what I've believed for a long time? Or have you really studied it out and said, okay, well, why do I really believe the, the Bible's the Word of God? Yeah. That can be a scary place to go, but if you're willing to let yourself go there, your faith will grow exponentially. Amen. Do some of the research on why these manuscripts can be trusted, why this is the Word of God, why the Bible validates that it's, it is the Word of God. It, it's so important. It can't just be, well, it says it's the Word of God. Any person that, who's a non-believer will laugh that, that reasoning off, right? So we've got to have better reasons for why do we believe the Bible is the Word of God. But then if we believe the Bible is the Word of God, we're supposed to do what? Use it for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And what I like to ask people sometimes is, okay, how do you tend to use the Bible in your own life? And typically the answer is for teaching. I, I like to learn and teach the idea of rebuking, the scriptures really rebuke my life, correct my life, train me. Not really. And that, that's probably most of us before we really started taking our faith seriously. So I like to ask that question because it kind of, it, it calls into question, am I using the Bible the way it's meant to be used? But this says it needs to be used this way so that we're fully equipped. So then what I say, so if, you have, if, only been, if you've only been using it for like 25% of the uses that it, it says it has, how equipped are you to actually live the life God has called you to? Only a little bit. Imagine going on to the, the, the I don't know, Heinz, Heinz Field to play football and all you have are some cleats. No pads, no helmet. You don't want to be partially equipped for that, right? We don't want to be partially equipped for this, this life that God has called us to. For two reasons. We're not going to enjoy it, but also we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to get hurt. It's not going to work out. We've got to make sure that we're, we're equipping and we're using Scripture in this way. We're using it in this way with each other and with ourselves. And then the question is, so if you haven't been using it in this way, what do you think needs to change? That's a powerful question again for us this morning. Let's look over at John chapter 8. 
Again, we're doing a little survey here, just, just talking through some principles of authentic discipleship. And I hope that this serves as a reminder or a challenge to us, but also some equipping for us to help others as well. John chapter 8. These are the words of Jesus. The evangelist John is sharing the good news uh, in a, uh, a radical way. And here in chapter 8, he's talking about this, this conversation that Jesus is having um, with some of his disciples, but also with some opponents to the faith. So John chapter 8, I like to start in verse 30. It says, even as he spoke, many believed in him. Verse 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Stop there. So this is a group of people, again, hopefully we know this in this room, but a group of people that already believed Jesus. And Jesus says, great, I'm so glad you believe. That's all you have to do. Thanks for coming to my seminar. I'll see you in heaven. No, he says, he, he takes it further. To the Jews who I believe, he says, uh, if you hold to my teachings, he gives an if-then principle. If you hold to my teachings, then you are my disciples. Then you know the truth, and the truth will genuinely set you free. That's what he's offering them. But he says there's an if. There's an if attached to your belief. You believe that's good, but it's only good if you hold to my teachings. The Bible is beyond belief. No, the Bible is beyond mere belief. We've got to make sure that we're applying it and not simply believing it. Some of us have kind of a Santa Claus faith. Or in our world today, there's kind of a Santa Claus faith. How does Santa Claus work? Okay, I believe that Santa Claus is in the North Pole. If I do my best to stay off the naughty list, then I get presents on Jesus' birthday. Seems like a fair deal. But we kind of do the same. We just change some of the nouns there, right? I believe that Jesus and God, they're in heaven. If I do my best to stay off the naughty list, then I'll get the present of eternal life. Seems like a, a solid deal. And our life is, okay, have I been too naughty, too nice? You know, it's just measuring that. And, and sometimes it's, it's frantic. You're, you're, you're filled with stress and shame. And am I good enough? Am I not good enough? And that's not the way we're meant to live. That's not the way we're meant to live, where we're constantly questioning, am I good enough? If you're asking that question, it's the wrong question. It's the wrong question. Is God enough? Is the right question. Not am I good enough? But anyway, that's how we can kind of live in that that description that, that, that I said just there, that's easy beliefism. Well, I just got to believe this thing. I just got to believe this. But what Jesus calls us to is, is true, authentic belief, which we know as discipleship. Being Jesus' disciple and following his words and obeying. Believing that he who's, uh, sorry, that Jesus is who he says he is, so I will devote myself to who he's calling me to be. Jesus is who he says he is, so I will devote myself to who he is calling me to be. He is master, and I will commit to being his student. It's not about perfection. It's not about perfection. Sometimes in a Bible study or in our own life, we can dismiss the call of discipleship because it's all or nothing by nature. And so this radical call of Jesus, we want to uh, disseminate and spread out and make easier make less or lighter because the all or nothing thing just doesn't really work for us. But it isn't perfection. What God is calling us to is devotion. We can be fatalistic and think, oh, well, no one can be perfect, so why even bother? Why really strive for this? But he's calling us to devotion, not perfection, but devotion. In fact, devotion is the opposite. It's by recognizing that I'm not perfect, that I do devote myself to he who is perfect and can make me perfect through the Holy Spirit. Let's move on to the next passage. Mark chapter 1. You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. Mark chapter 1. This is where Jesus calls his disciples. This, you know, John 8 is where things kind of switch a little bit from, from talking about the Word of God to how we apply the Word of God as Christians today. We share Jesus' expectation for those that want to follow him. Mark 1. Sometimes I repeat it because if I don't repeat it, I, I don't know where I'm going <laughs> in my own Bible. I end up in like Exodus. How did I get here? All right, Mark chapter 1, verse 14. It says, uh, After John was, putting, uh, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When they had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We spent a lot of time on this passage, just the, the incredible nature of Jesus' vision for these guys. But I like to point out here that becoming a disciple simply changes everything. Becoming a disciple changes everything. Not easy, but simple. It changes everything. The, their whole identity changed. We are fishermen, and now we have a completely new identity. We are fishers of men. We go out and fish for people. Now, there's no such thing as a Christian that's not on the mission. There's, there's no such thing as, as a disciple that's not on the mission. If we're not on the mission, we're not disciples. If we're not on the mission, we're not Christians. Now, the mission might look different at different stages of our life, at different moments. The mission might be uh, those nearest to you. The mission is going to look uh, different at different times. But every Christian should be on the mission. He said, following me means that you're fishing for people. That everything has changed. It's great to ask in a Bible study, great to ask ourselves this morning, if I were to truly follow Jesus, what would be different? How can following Jesus completely change my marriage? And in a Bible study, ask someone, how could following Jesus change the way you parent your kids? How could following Jesus change the way you see your sin and your shame and the guilt that you experience? How could following Jesus change your purpose, change your contentment, change the nature of your relationships? Will you let Jesus change everything? Because that's what he wants to do in your life. We can't follow Jesus and not change. It doesn't happen. And it's an important thing to point out in this passage, but it's also important to point out again for us today, if we are going to follow Jesus, then we've got to make sure that we're striving to make disciples too. We've got to be the bright stars. It's not just one person, two or three people, but we all need to know the gospel and seek to share it with others. And if you don't feel like you're able to, that's okay. Start there. <laughs> I don't know how to, but I want to learn. Amen. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to know all these passages. Maybe write them down today. Grab a book. The Go With God book has all these things. It's a great tool. We don't have to know anything, but we have to want to help others to know God. Why can we love others if we're not willing to help them know God? The greatest gift we can give them or give somebody. All right, Luke 9 and 14. You're like, which one do I turn to? We're going to be in Luke 9 and then immediately over in Luke 14. Okay. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. I love this. I, I wish, you know, John 3, 16 is a fantastic passage. It gets kind of a bad rep. It's a great scripture, but it's, you know, on, on uh, it's everywhere in football games. I would love to see Luke 9, 23, you know, different places because it really is the, the meat of what it means to follow Jesus. Luke 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the entire world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now turn with me over to Luke 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You can read more of, of that another time. But I like looking at these passages one right after the other. Because the first one starts with, if you want to follow Jesus, these are all the things that you, you should strive for. Then the second one says that if you don't do these things, you can't be my disciple. 
And it's almost like Jesus has this cap at the bottom, right? And then we can, we can say, okay, to follow Jesus, yes, I should strive to deny myself, follow him, all this stuff. But then Jesus says, but if you're not doing that, you can't be my disciple. And I like looking at this because it's so weird when we think about who Jesus is. We don't expect Jesus ever saying, you can't follow me. Like, you're like, not my Jesus, do you? You know, and it's open to everybody, but everyone is called to the same standard. Right? It's open to everyone. Anyone can. He says, if anyone. But he says, but if you're going to do it, there's an expectation. There's a standard. And what I love about both of these passages are the, the two words, if anyone. Meaning it's a universal standard, if anyone. Anyone in the first century, anyone in the second century, let's give them a few, anyone in the 21st century, supplies us if anyone wants to be his disciple. This is the expectation. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And we won't, if you're visiting with us, you've never read this passage before, you're like, hate your mother, what, is, what does that mean? The, sit down with someone, we'd love to say that out. But basically you just saying, I want you to be so devoted to me that everything pales in comparison. And a side note, one of the reasons I love studying the Bible with people is that I get reminders of these truths all the time. Even uh, on, on Friday, I was sitting down looking at this passage with someone, and it stood out to me that, you know, that anytime there's a dash in the Bible, I'm always kind of like, okay, I don't know Greek, so I'm like, I wonder what the, the Greek dash, or how does that work? But it says, yes, even your own life. And for me, I thought, okay, in some ways, we can get good at like, okay, I got to prioritize God over over family obligations, over people, over this relationship and that relationship. But it's almost like Jesus needs that extra reminder, like, yeah, even your own life. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I felt convicted because I was like, yeah, I haven't been doing a great job of that. Like, I get the boundaries I need to set in these things here and there. But what about my own life? The alarm started going off. My own life needs that help. There's a little joke there, the alarm in the background. I'm sure none of you could notice that that was going off. But uh, I, these passages are so important to the message of what it means to follow Christ. But we can't look at these and not point out that Jesus does for us exactly what he's calling us to do. He denies himself in the garden. He takes up his cross, and, and he calls us to follow him. He, he never calls us to go someplace he hasn't gone. Right? He loves us. He gave up the whole world. He forfeited himself so that we could have life. It's important for us to make sure that we pass it on. Jesus isn't calling us just to follow him for the sake of following him. But he's calling us to follow him because he loves us. And he wants us to follow him. So if you're studying the Bible with someone and get to this point, this is a great point to share. You know what? I want to tell you how I became a Christian. What helped me follow Christ? What helped me commit to knowing him? In fact, what we're going to do right now is take about two or three minutes and share with someone. Maybe not a spouse if you're sitting next to a spouse. But share with someone uh, the following question. I think I have it on the screen, Allison. What have you had to let go of in order to follow Jesus? And maybe currently you don't know the answer to this question, and that's okay too, you can share that. But in your life, what, what did you have to let go of, or what have you had to keep letting go of in order to follow Jesus? So take a, about two minutes here to share that with someone sitting near you, and break it. All right. As you wrap up that question, you can finish in just a second, but the next question is, uh, what makes it worthwhile? So what made it worthwhile in your life? So you can add that as well. Take a few more minutes. Amen. You guys are, are free to talk after service some more. We have, uh, in fact, <laughs> we're going to have some Rita's after church. And I think it's raining, but we have Rita's. We'll have it over in the pavilion over there, so... Uh, that should be a good time to continue the conversation. But it's great when you're in a Bible study to ask someone, maybe at a certain point in time, what do you think will be the hardest or the most difficult thing in being an authentic follower of Jesus? To ask someone, what do you think going forward, if you're, if you're truly to take up this call to be an authentic follower, what will be the most difficult? And then we get to give a little plug of, that's why we have the church. Of course it's going to be difficult. <laughs> Everything we just read is really, really hard. It's, yeah, one universal standard, but one tough standard. But that's why God gives us each other. Right? That's why we need the church. It's why we don't do it on our own. You know, I, I need this reminder for myself. We'll kind of close, close here in just a moment. But uh, I like asking someone, so after looking at all this, do you really want to be an authentic follower of Jesus? And most people that are studying the Bible, most of us would say, yeah, of course. 
It's tough, but yeah. And then I say, why? Do we just read the same verses? You know, I, I went to school and I, I studied a little bit of, of public relations PR. I didn't do great on my class, but I know that this was a terrible PR plan of Jesus. Deny yourself, take up your cross, uh, don't be ashamed of him, give up this life, uh, hate this, hate that, hate even your own life, give up everything to follow. What in the world? Get, you know, you're no longer this, but you're this, your identity changes. Why on earth would you want to do this? I kind of say it tongue, tongue in cheek, but we need to know our why. Yeah. We need to help people know their why. And you can't just because, well, that's what it says. That only get us so far. What's the why? And I'll share my why with you. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. My why is that I believe not only that God exists, but that God knows what's best. That by following him, my life will be better. It may not always feel better, but according to God, who I trust, it will be better. The gospel message for me is simply this. God is better. God is greater, a greater sign, whatever you want. That's what it is for me. That's my why. So when it gets tough, if I can believe that God is better, why? Because I believe that God knows what's best for me. I believe that God is the master designer, and I want to follow his, his design plans. That's my why. What's yours? If you were to say, why on earth would you want to be a disciple? What, what would your answer be? Brothers and sisters, what we talked about today is more than a Bible study or a sermon about a Bible study. It's a little bit of both today. But it's about Jesus. Jesus says that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is, uh, tr uh, the truth that Jesus is, what was teaching was his way of life. The way that he lived showed the things that he taught. For us, church, we have a decision. Are we going to be a church that teaches authentic discipleship? Or are we going to be a church full of authentic disciples? Are we going to be a church that teaches authentic discipleship? Or is a church full of authentic disciples? The difference is you. We're going to keep teaching it either way. But it's you and me. Are we going to live this way? Will we choose to live this way? We get to answer that question. And uh, as we go through this series, what we're trying to do is have two questions that we end every service with to take with you. And one is for others, you know, one, or one is for within the church, you know, one another question, and the other is a mission question. And the one another question is this, what has been affecting your authenticity in your discipleship? Ask one another this week, when you meet up for discipleship times, when you, when you have a, 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 a lunch or a coffee with someone, ask, what has been affecting your authenticity in your discipleship? And then a question to ask someone not in this room, someone uh, on the mission field, when you're talking to someone, talking to a neighbor, what do you think it means to be an authentic Christian? The world loves authenticity, and rightly so. No one, no one likes uh, falseness. No one likes something that's fake. But what, is it, what do you think it really means to be an authentic Christian? That's a conversation at Starbucks. That's a conversation in line with your mechanic, whatever it is. Right? If your mechanic is Rick, then the, the one another question applies to, to that conversation. But um, again, this isn't just a technique or an idea. This is a call for us to be the stars in the sky. Will you shine? Let's go. Amen. <laughs> Will you shine? Brothers and sisters, let's go with God and light up the night in Pittsburgh.